Uh, how many minutes is the presentation for? Mine? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the duration of my presentation? My presentation, sir. Your presentation is already done. Yes. What the? How long? Ah, four lengths. How many minutes are you going to do? Four to. Four to five. Good evening, everyone present here. I would like to welcome you all to the SEVA Social Work Students Forum and Sian Campaign Club, Madras Christian College, for for the Jonathan Callaghan Lecture Series on the topic with wetland encroachment and restoration. Before we start the webinar, there are few in general instructions to be followed. I would request all the participants to. Turn off the audio and video throughout the program. We are also live streaming our lecture series for the participants who find problem to join the Zoom platform. If you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat box. Our speaker will try to respond to all the questions. The feedback form will be put at the end of the session in both Zoom and YouTube platform. Please do fill the feedback form. to qualify for your e certificate to begin with i would like to invite dr miriam samwell head of the department social work aided by drax christian college to give welcome address over to you ma'am thank you jamaima thank you jamaima for inviting me to give the welcome address uh good evening everybody gathered here on the zoom platform uh all the members of seva the students association of the department of social work of madras christian college uh, our guest speaker and all the participants both on the zoom platform and on the youtube channel it is my pleasure and my privilege to welcome each of you this evening as we gather together like this virtually to learn and to share knowledge i do understand that we are in very difficult times times that we do not understand and are not able to comprehend with a lot of limitations placed on us in terms of our work environment and our social and personal life but even in the midst of all this i think what has happened for all of us very especially in the field of social work and those in the field of education is that the e platforms has lent itself to a lot of learning and sharing a lot of development in the field of knowledge and skill development a lot of connections have been built both at the professional and the personal level and i think that is something that we are grateful for this evening as we gather together like this for yet another webinar of the department of social work of madras christian college we have over the last few months i think right from uh, early may or end of april been organizing a number of webinars to get our students together on the platform and also to get other professionals across the country and the globe to come together and to share and to be connected together during this time i know social distancing quarantine containment zones uh, not being allowed to travel all these are words that we are very familiar with at this point of time but we have made efforts through the e platforms to stay connected so that we can continue to learn and grow and contribute professionally to the needs of people and the world around us and this evening dear participants and friends as we gather together for yet another webinar 
I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this webinar being held now on wetlands encroachment and restoration. And I'm very, very happy, proud, privileged to welcome into our midst a very good friend of the Department of Social Work, Mr. Nityanand Jairaman, who's an environmental activist, a person we've looked up to, admired for his commitment and the way in which he has been involved with passion in environmental activism. A person who stood up for environmental rights, advocating for the rights of environment and people who have been affected by this environment. Mr. Nityanand Jairaman is no stranger to the Department of Social Work. He's visited us on more than one occasion to share his experience and his passion with the students and faculty of social work, both at NCC and other parts who've come to the college for conferences and seminars. Mr. Nityanand, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And we really look forward to listening to you. And we also wish you very well at this time that God will be with you, keep you safe and healthy. To all the participants who are here, we're very happy that you're here. We trust that you, your families, and those who are connected with you and your communities are safe and taking care of yourselves. Uh, wetlands, as we're going to talk about, and which our speaker is going to be addressing on all these uh, issues related to land, is a critical part of our ecosystem. Very often we think it is wasteland. We think it's land that is not being used. And both government and others concerned and communities and people try to exploit this kind of a land for development and for their own personal use. But this is a critical part of our ecosystem and our natural environment. And it plays a major role in reducing the impact of disasters, in safeguarding our land around that place, in observing pollu absorbing pollution and helping to improve the quality of water around this place. In addition to this, it is also life to a lot of animals and plants and also provides life to people and communities around it. I still remember early years when my children were very small, we would go on the two-wheeler driving from Tamram to the Pallikarnai Marsh. And I still remember having little picnics there with the children, watching the water birds and all the plants that were growing around there. But we can no longer do it today with all the pollution and the encroachments that have taken place on the Pallikarna Marsh. And we all know those of us who are in Chennai and living towards that side, we do know that the encroachment into this wetland has affected the communities and people living around there, leading to flooding during rainy season poor quality of water and draining of groundwater because that has become polluted and encroached upon. And therefore, dear friends, I think this is an important area for us to discuss about, very especially even as social workers, activists who are gathered here, or those of us who belong to social sciences or even other sciences like botany, to understand and recognize that natural environment, people and communities are interlinked, interconnected, and interdependent. And we cannot separate these entities at all. So if communities and people have to be sustained, and then we really have to take care of our environment also. And that's why in social work, we have a whole focus on green social work or environmental social work today, because we understand that people, communities are interconnected, interlinked and interdependent. With these few words of introduction, I once again welcome our speaker, Mr. Nityanand into our midst and all the dear participants who are gathered from across the country. And we do hope we have a fruit, fruitful session of listening and learning and taking back things back to implement in our own places. Thank you all very much and a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I am privileged to welcome and introduce our speaker, Mr. Nityanand Jairaman. Mr. Nityanand Jairaman is from Chennai, a India-based teacher, writer, and a social activist. He is also a member of the Vetiver Collective and Chennai Solidarity Group, a collective that fights for the environmental injustice and discrimination. He is an engineer turned journalist and activist. 
His group has played a critical role in expanding democratic space of community struggle, including the campaign for injustice for sorry for justice in Bhopal, the campaigning against Unilever's mercury pollution in Kodaikanal, also to the fishermen folks struggling in Enno wetlands at Chennai, and also the protest by residents of Tuticore against UK multinational sterilized copper polluting metalator. Now, um, now presently is teaching journalism at the Asian College of Journalism. It is such a honor to have you in our midst, sir. Now, I would like you to take up the session. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share the screen and begin with my presentation. All right. Okay, so I hope you can uh, see this clearly. Good. <clears throat> okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samuel um, and uh, Jemima for the kind introduction. Um, we have been hearing a lot about COVID, which is the coronavirus disease. Uh, there is another pandemic that has been affecting the planet for close to two centuries. And that disease is called development or what we call development itself is manifesting itself in the form of a disease and the symptoms of which we see around us in the form of pollution and environmental catastrophes. Uh, it is my case that what we define as development and how we went about this uh, act of developing has actually been exploitative of our relationship with nature and worse it has also been exploitative of people's relationship with people. So we have a situation where after 270 years of quote unquote modern civilization we are far more vulnerable than we were ever before in the history of human settlement or human existence on this planet. I'm talking about not just the climate crisis, but also about the possibility of a global ecosystem collapse. So the topic that I'm going to be talking about is that these are things that this crisis cannot be addressed, cannot be solved without understanding what the problems are that have led to this crisis. And one of the things that we keep talking about, we keep thinking about is some technology will come in, some laws will come in, and those laws and the technology together will somehow transform and take us away from this disaster. But I think one of the key things that needs to change if we are to um, look towards a healthy future is the culture. And culture is something that is, it's like a song that's being sung around us all the time in your schools, in your colleges, in society, in your workplace, inside your home, what your mother tells you, what your father tells you, what you want, what you tell other people. And if you look at this culture, this culture currently tells you to compete, to become the first, per, the first ranker or the first something or the richest person or the fastest, whatever. So what is being emphasized is a competition, not cooperation. Cooperation is undermined. Cooperation is suppressed. And if we want to get out of this problem, I think cooperation would be a very, very important value to nurture and to bring about. Um, the second uh, cultural issue is the issue of what we consider valuable and what we don't. And that is what my presentation today is about. Uh, you can see the first slide on the screen says revalorizing the Porambok. The Porambok for people who speak Tamil is a well-known word. And if you're in Chennai, it is known to be a word of um, you know, it's it's a it's, it's a it's a, a derogatory or a pejorative word. Uh, Porambok is something that Chennaiites use to curse others, to make others feel small and insignificant. And the word actually means um, a worthless person or a worthless place. But the actual meaning of the word Porambok, it's a medieval Tamil 
agrarian word. It's a word that comes from revenue classifications. And this refers to places reserved for shared communal uses. What a beautiful concept of sharing spaces. So when uh, uh, Professor Samuel was talking about going to Pallikarne, Pallikarne is a public space. It's a porambok. It's a Kaliveli porambok. Kaliveli porambok is a floodplains porambok. Anybody can go there. So when she went there, she might have seen the birds using it. There might have been uh, Narikoravars uh, hunting over there. There might be fisher folk. There might be people harvesting the reeds and taking the reeds to make mats and other things. So it's a place, it's, it's a place that has something for every, everybody. People like us who might not have a material benefit from that forum book, go there just to enjoy, maybe write a poem or just to sing a song or whatever. So these are extremely important spaces. This word and these spaces have been degraded in our culture into meaning something that is worthless, a worthless person or a worthless place. If we want, if we have any chance of getting out of this crisis, we have to be able to give this space and the forum book, the word, the respect it deserves and the value it deserves. There are three, how did this become worthless? There are three rules governing forum book and all these three rules goes against what we call development. First rule, you cannot build a roof, you cannot lay a floor, and you cannot buy it or sell it. And as far as this economy of ours is concerned, it valorizes private property. If you don't own something, you are worthless. You're a porambok. If a place cannot be owned, it is porambok. And that porambok, it has a derogatory meaning. It also does not yield any tax to the government. In, instead, it gives things to society as a whole. It might give something to the fisherman. It might give something to the reed weaver. It might give something to the potter. It might give something to the poet. It might give recreation to people like us. So these places have to remain open and unbuilt. You cannot build on it. And if you look at our economy, our economy is what I call a paved earth economy, which means our economy does not see value unless land is paved. Something has to be built, it has to be dug, it has to be covered in concrete or on asphalt. Big building has to stand there, a port has to stand there, a layout has to stand there, a road has to run through it, a dam has to be built on it, an airport has to be built on it. Something has to be done to the land in order for us to think it is valuable. Otherwise, as we call it in Tamil, we call it Potagad, which is just worthless land, has now become developed. What has happened to that place? So if, you, if you go to your village and say, my village is now developed. What you're saying is your village now has more buildings. It has probably a larger road. And so we call it development. So our association of development, it might mean anything. And in social work, you might learn that development essentially is about improving or increasing the human quality of life. And you would be right. But that definition has long been discarded. Right now, what does development mean? Ettivari sale. Eight lane expressway. It means an Adani port. It means a Kanyakumari port. It means a nuclear power plant. And this is what we have come to. These are some of the examples of uh, uh, Porambok. On your, on your right hand, on your left hand side of the screen, you see the Porambok Commons. These are different kinds of livelihoods, different kinds of values that we get from it. And in this battle of value and worth, the Porambok has low values, low value, because it is primarily unbuilt. And when we look at unbuilt infrastructure, we see it as land whose potential has not yet been unleashed. And that that potential will be unleashed by private investment. That is why we have our chief minister, our prime minister, our finance minister, everybody talking about investment coming in. And that is why you have a whole army of people who cry when sterlite is shut down. Because investment, private property, digging up the earth, creating new minds, this is what is considered to be of value. This is what we call development. So even when we talk, we say, but we need development. We never say, but we need environment. We always say, but we need development. But if you look at this, this right now, there's a lot of conversation going on about this word infrastructure, that India's infrastructure needs to be upgraded in order to invite foreign capital. And when they say infrastructure, they're essentially talking about built infrastructure. Built infrastructure is a highway is seen as an infrastructure. 
what you see on your left hand side, which says high value built infrastructure, private property is seen as infrastructure. Do people see what's on the right hand side as infrastructure? I don't think so. Because what we will have is we will have a transmission, electrical transmission line running across these beautiful uh, grasslands and the Shola forest. And we will call the electricity transmission line an infrastructure, but we will not see the land that it passes through as an infrastructure. If you look at this land, this is actually a, a photograph of uh, grasslands and Shola forest uh, from the Western Ghats, uh, specifically from the Palni Hills and the uh, Nilgiris in, in, in that region. And these grasslands are infrastructures of biodiversity, they're infrastructure of life, they're infrastructure of water. Uh, this is somewhere in the Palni Hills. In all likelihood, a drop of water that escapes from these places would end up in the Vaigai River, which takes care of the parched plains of Madurai and Ramanathapuram districts, Madurai, Sivaganga and Ramanathapuram districts. And if you look at the Shola forest, it is found in the folds of the hills. And these grasslands tend to receive the water. The grasslands are very ordinary looking places. In fact, most of Porambok is very ordinary. They are like the lungi clad Tamil people. They're worth a lot of money, a lot more than the nice smelling software engineers, but they are poorly recognized. We don't see them as important, primarily because they come from certain communities, they look like that, and they don't have the private property and the private assets that other people have. So these are great infrastructures of uh, water. And as long as you leave your grasslands and your Shola forests intact, the plains will never suffer from water scarcity. Um, so urban floods, of course, if you've if you've been in Chennai for more than two years, you know that this is a city of disasters. Uh, we move from one disaster to another. We just had the heat wave disaster. Last, the year before that, we had our uh, our uh, water scarcity. Uh, the year before that, we had the Varda Puyal, Varda Cyclone. Before that, we had the Gaja Cyclone. No, we had the Gaja Cyclone and the Varda Cyclone. Then we had the, um, we had the uh, uh, 2015 floods. So we limp from one, and the way we remember years is, 2015 floods, 2016 cyclone, 2019 water scarcity. This is how in Chennai we mark our calendar. And we so now we'll very soon be moving on to our next disaster season, which is the rainy season. So we don't have normals over here. Everything is abnormal. And that is the normal for Chennai. And if you look at urban, like you know, just a few days ago, there was a there were heavy rains in Bangalore and the city flooded. You have heavy rains in Kolkata, you have heavy rains in, in Bombay, and the city floods. You have heavy rains in Chennai, it floods. So if it rains, it will flood. If it doesn't rain, we will starve. We won't have water. So how did this come about? So here again is a story not about planning, development, infrastructure. It is about what we value and what we don't. This is how water behaves. When water falls on earth, the earth first has to soak it. It becomes soaked and saturated. And once it's soaked and saturated, any more water that falls on it will run off. Now, if I have sandy soil, more water will go in and very little will run off. It will take a lot more rain for waters to flow on top of sand. But if I have clay, it takes less rains for water to flow. If I have concrete, then all the water that falls on the concrete will run off and will not go into the ground. And so that will again lead to two things, poor recharge of groundwater and an increased risk of flooding. As the water runs, it finds its places. The water has its favorite places to hang out in. It likes hanging out in depressions, in shallow or deep depressions. And if you want water to come to you, you make a depression. The depression is like a welcome sign to water. You also have um, water running through, uh, going into wells, into lakes and water bodies. The overflow from that goes into streams, into rivers, and finally ends up in the ocean. The water's dharma is to reach the ocean. Engineers who say that that is water wasted do not know what they're talking about. Fresh water has to reach the ocean. The ocean and fresh water are good friends. They need to meet. They can't meet on Zoom. They have to meet physically. And so that is something that we always have to keep in mind. So if we are taking away, we have to make sure that there is enough water to go and reach the sea. Otherwise, we will be in trouble. I will explain later. This is a map of Chennai. And on the northern, which is uh, on the topmost, you see a river called a river, a blue line, a long blue line that runs from the left to the right. And that river is called the Kosaskalayar River. And that river is the only river that actually has a delta 
at a large backwater network, and that backwater network is called the Ennur Pulikath Wetlands. The second river in the middle is a river that you would like to be likely to be very uh, familiar with. If you're in Egmore, that river runs very close to you. It's called the Kuom, and um, it meets a sea in the northern part of uh, Marina Beach, near where the Napiers Bridge is. If you're sleeping, you'll be woken up by a smell. You know you have reached island grounds. The third river is Adyar River, which uh, opens up into the sea about one kilometer from where I live. Um, and uh, that's in Adyar. And uh, south of the Adyar River is the Besan Nagar Beach. So these three rivers are essentially drains. When I say drains, I don't mean sakade, I don't mean a gutter. I mean a place through which water flows from land towards the sea. A place through which water moves is called a drain. Uh, these are natural drains. And these drains have been formed from a network of uh, irrigation tanks and other water sources that flow. None of these rivers are perennial. All the rivers are seasonal rivers. And um, if you look at the blue dots that you see all through the uh, map, uh, all these blue dots, uh, dots are, or, or you know, blue uh, areas are all water bodies, irrigation tanks. All of them, pretty much all of them are artificial, human-made irrigation tanks. Chennai has a very flat topography. Water does not like to stay here. So if you want to come and have a village and practice agriculture, the first thing you have to do is to find a way for water to stay. And what do you do to make water stay? You build a shallow depression. You dig up some earth, water will come and stay. stay. As I told you earlier, that is a welcome sign. And the old Tamil, the ancient Tamil engineers were fantastic engineers. They were very good at understanding how water flows. They were good at understanding how, where to build an irrigation tank. So all these things that you see are the things that brought in settlements into Chennai. And all these tanks were catechically, once you, once you cut a tank, all the tank area and the areas that belong to the tank, which is near the tanks, and the area through which water comes to the tank, all these areas are quickly defined as porambok. Porambok means don't touch. You can enjoy it, but you cannot build on it, you cannot buy it, and you cannot sell it. And if you do that, you will be treated very badly by the medieval Tamil farmer. Uh, now, of course, it's a very different thing. You may you, we have entire politicians who have made a career out of, uh, you know, grabbing porambok lands. Uh, so when you have all these network of uh, irrigation tanks, when they fill up, they then overflow and enter one of these rivers called the Kuam, Adyar, and Kosasthalaya. On our coast, we have a sandy coast, and the sandy coast is fantastic because that's, again, a hidden infrastructure of water. If you've been to a river like Palar or you've seen one of the large perennial rivers in, in India, like uh, Krishna or Godavari or, or uh, uh, say, Yamuna or uh, Kaveri, uh, you will notice that in the dry season, the, the, the bed, river bed is all filled with sand. You dig about one meter deep into it, you'll find that there is fresh water. So sand is always a reservoir of fresh water. And along the coast of Chennai, when you have large sand dunes, these sand dunes pre prevent water from, uh, prevent the seawater from coming into the land and, and salinizing our groundwater. Uh, so we actually have a natural infrastructure natural and human made in the form of tanks and infrastructure that protects us from what is Chennai's natural behavior. Chennai's natural behavior is hot during the summer. It rains heavily. So we have the Northeast monsoon, which will uh, inshallah start sometime in November, uh, October, November. And the Northeast monsoon is not like your Southwest monsoon. Southwest monsoon is a very well behaved monsoon. Generally speaking, it comes on time. It goes on time. It generally pours every day. So if you have a rainy day, if you have a rainy season, if you take your umbrella, you will use it. Those of you who have lived in Chennai, you know that if you take an umbrella, it will never rain. It will rain only when you don't take an umbrella and when you're standing outside. That is because the Northeast monsoon is a rowdy monsoon. It does not follow any rules. It will come one year. It will not come another year. It will come and behave like a very gentlemanly, a very well-behaved monsoon one year. And the next year, it will be completely weirded out. That is the Northeast monsoon. That's how it has been even uh, 100 years, 200, 300 years ago. And that is why, as an insurance, we have all these irrigated, uh, you know, irrigation tanks and other things where we can hold the water and keep it for a 
not a rainy day, but for a dry day. <clears throat> so what we call development can also be called destruction. So if you look at this development, Chennai developed from being a sleepy little overgrown village in 1980, where out of the 1,200 square kilometer land area of the city, only 47 square kilometers of land was under concrete or some form of a hard substance, areas through which water cannot penetrate. In by, four, by 2010, that is about five years before our disaster, uh, the flooding disaster, the built up area had increased from 47 to 402 square kilometers. Simultaneously, you see that there is also a decline in the wetland area. So when one goes up, another goes down. So what you call development is only about growth and only about more buildings. Then you have to be prepared to have buildings and probably no life in the city. The city does not have a future if we continue to go on like this. This brings me to the next issue, that environment is not an issue that affects everybody equally. If you're a woman, it affects you differently. If you're a, a Dalit laborer, it affects you differently. If you are Mukesh Ambani, it does not affect you at all. If you are a rich person, it probably affects you less. If you're living in the fourth floor, it affects you less or differently. So everything is different about it. And in this, the poor and the marginalized communities, historically marginalized communities, which include women, are at the receiving end. So even within uh, a well-to-do family, even within a, say, a middle-class family, like where most of us come from, if you look at the home environment, the home environment, if you, if you ask which is the most dangerous or toxic place, poisonous place inside the home environment, one would say that even within what we call as a safe space in the home, the kitchen and the bathroom are more problematic because there are more chemicals used. You use chemicals to wash your utensils. You use chemicals to wash your commode or your bathroom. These are acids. These are poisonous, hazardous chemicals. The other place where you find hazardous chemicals, a lot of it is on our dressing cabinet. All the things that we use to beautify ourselves are mostly, generally speaking, extremely toxic chemicals. If you look at who are exposed more to this, if from the garbage to cleaning the bathroom, you will find that even amongst most of our families, it would be the women folk. It would either be the mothers in the family or the sisters in the family or the maids that come to serve there. In some families, there might be men doing it and that is very good. There must be more of it. But generally speaking, men also sharing in that work is not the rule, it is the exception. In the same way, when we talk about the city of Chennai and encroachments, the only encroachments that will be removed are the encroachments of the poor, like what we see on the right-hand side. And these are encroachments of survival. They have not come there out of choice. They would like to live in better places, but the city does not have room for them. We have marginalized them. So they live in the margins of the rivers, of the roads, of the seas. And so we call them marginalized communities. And these structures that are there on the, on the banks of the uh, Buckingham Canal cannot really harm the city. In, the, in, in, in times of heavy rains, the water flows and washes away these places. People come back and rebuild. What you see on your left-hand side is called Chennai One. It's a large, ugly building uh, that belongs to IT companies sitting inside Palikarnai marshland. This was carved out of the Palikarnai marshland. And look at the size of it. Of course, fact aside that you see the second sunshade on top, there was water till there. And I will tell you the story about that later. So you had, you had turtles and snakes in the first floor of the uh, ITSEZ. Um, this is not only a danger to itself because you have close to 5,000 people working in there. So it's a danger to the people who are working in there, but it's also a danger to the surrounding communities because it blocks water and diverts water. This has been built on higher ground. The Palikarne marshland has been filled and raised by about a meter to build this. So the areas that were built around it, which were built on safe places, but all of a sudden now you have this is much higher. And people who live near highways know that the road slowly becomes taller. Just like your child is growing, your road also grows and your house suddenly goes into a depression. When the water comes, it does not drain out. You have a similar uh, um, problem over here and it's a threat to others. They will not be removed. They will not be evicted. No court has the courage to say that. Whereas these people will be removed. This is a picture of the Palikarane marshland. And, uh, or one section of it, the Palikarne Marshland is actually a 50 square kilometer uh, area, um, uh, 50 square kilometer water spread area. And it drains a catchment 
of 250 square kilometers, which means water that falls on 250 square kilometers of land on the western side will flow and come into this place to reside. That is, water that falls as rain will first go into the ground if there is no hard surface over there. If there's hard surface over there, it will immediately flow towards the Pallikarna. So when you look at these two images on the left and the right, the right is more recent, and you'll see on the top left-hand corner of the right image, you see a lot of development, which means that much land is not available for the rainwater to go in. So even with little rain, more water will come into the Pallikarne marshland. The second thing that you need to see in this is where it says Wipro in uh, Technologies CDC 5 SEZ on the bottom left-hand corner. That area was untouched marshland. 380 uh, acres of that land, of that water, which is a Kadiveli Parambuk, was carved out and handed over to the Sholing and Allur Elcott Special Economic Zone because Chennai has to develop. Now you've handed over 385 acres of your wetland to an IT industry, which does not even have to go to work. You see that the last six months, last five months, the IT industry has been working from home and their profits have not dwindled. And now you have 385 acres of wasted real estate inside the Palikarne marshland. And this place has also, also got very badly flooded. And Mr. Azim Premji from Wipro, who has a very large heart, I don't deny that, handed over a check of one crore to Jailalitha. And there was a photograph of him that was posted in the Hindu. That one crore is not a donation. That is a very meager penalty for messing around with the city's water and for putting the city in a threat. This is the Velacheri Eri. And on the bottom left-hand place where you see Panchayat office on the right side, on the left-hand side, you have a, a, a red and white kind of a map. The Panchayat office area, that is the area where you have the Phoenix Mall. For those of you, just for orientation, everybody knows Phoenix Mall. Nobody knows there was a lake over there. <clears throat> and this lake, if you look at 1970s, that lake is a porombok. You cannot build on it. By 2015, you can look at the what's happened to the lake. So you have layouts inside the lake. And when you have a layout, when you build a house inside the lake, the lake, the house does not get flooded because lakes don't get flooded. Lakes get filled up. If you build a house inside a lake, then your house will get filled up. If you want to avoid flooding or if you want to avoid your house getting filled up, then you have to move your house away from the lake because water has a memory. It will come back over there. This is the southern part of this. So beside, below the uh, Velacheri Lake and on the left-hand side, uh, on the western side of the Velacheri Lake, you see another two uh, red color lines. Those are the Adambakam Periya Eri and the Adambakam Chinna Eri. Both the Eris are gone. It is just like that Vadivel movie about uh, the well having been stolen. We have stolen, the Chennai city has stolen these water bodies. Uh, and also just beneath the Velacheri Lake, there's a large area that is left untouched, no buildings. Whereas on the, on, on, on the north of, there is on top of Velacheri Lake, you see a lot of red color. All that is built up area, settlements. Why was this, the south not built up? Because those are called Meikal Porambok or areas reserved for grazing. And grazing areas are generally areas where water stands for one, two months of the year. And when water comes there, it brings with it one of its best friends, that is silt or mud. And that mud is very important for that land. Things grow on that and you can spread it. Mekal Porambok is meant primarily for grazing, but communities have used it for grazing. They've used it for water. They've used it for collection of medicinal herbs. So it's a very, very important place in Tamil culture. And you have the equivalence of it in other cultures as well. But all that has now been taken over by the IT corridors uh, development. And all these were areas that were underwater and will be underwater next time will be underwater 10 years from now as well, because that's where the water comes. This is the Kodungayur area in north. Uh, Kodungayur is also a place where we all the garbage from the city goes. The, the city, city's guy, when we talk about Swachh Bharat, Swachh Bharat is such an idiotic idea, the way it has been practiced. Because what do we do? A lot of you might have also joined, you know, beach cleanup drives. What we are engaging in when we clean up one place is essentially collecting garbage from one place and moving it to another. It doesn't require clever people to do that. 
it does not require environmentally conscious people to do that it requires either idiots or unthinking people who have been brainwashed or it requires extremely racist casteist people who will throw the garbage from one place onto another and i say racist caste casteist because garbage does never goes up the uh, money chain you cannot take garbage if i, I cannot do a swachh bharat by cleaning up the kodungiyo dump yard and dumping it in uh, you know green waste road that will not be permitted that is called dirtying up a place but if i clean up green waste road and dump it in kodungiyo where there is a very high proportion of dalit people a high proportion of working people that is considered to be swachh bharat and the police will protect that this i'm saying is at the bottom of our environmental problems environmental problems are not a green problem it is not a green solution so if you are practicing environmentalism it has to have all colors there is red there is brown if you look at most of the porombox porombox are brown and they are like us they are they are dark but they are very very valuable so you need to have an entire rainbow of colors to describe the environment it cannot be restricted to green green is the collect this is the color of elite bourgeois environmentalism so be very careful when we use the word green uh, because there it will then mean some symbolic things like Uh, uh cleaning up garb cleaning up the beach or planting a tree why don't you plant grasses why don't you plant thorny scrub the the native vegetation of chennai are not large trees the native vegetation of chennai is the palmyra the native vegetation of chennai is grasses and sedges and and shrubs and thorny scrub so these things are needed over here because they are what can survive chennai when we had the varda cyclone we saw a lot of trees falling those trees were not chennai trees they were trees that were not capable of handling the the winds that chennai regularly faces i'm showing you this picture because again this area is gone but in this area you will see that the uh, construction in the right hand side is all in straight lines if you see straight lines it means that there is an engineer who has been at work because engineers cannot think in curves they cannot think in 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 irregular shapes everything has to be straight lines and geometric shapes and so if they see a river that is you know kind of Uh, winding its way they will make it straight and say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and this river is being very inefficient and badly behaved let us straighten it that will have that has a huge effect on the flooding and also on the uh, e e the ecology of the river uh this is a favorite picture of mine this is in siruseri and uh, they built a knowledge center there uh, what you see on the left hand side is uh uh sand and all the dark things that are forming like tentacles those are all played those are all uh tracks made by water flowing and the sand over there means that this is a fantastic aquifer recharge zone groundwater recharge is fantastic like the pallikarne marshland this area are all natural rainwater harvesting systems so if you want to look at rainwater harvesting infrastructure you have it over here you have not paid a single paisa for it all you have to do it is allow it to remain a porambok don't build on it and this will give you water for ever but in this place we built our knowledge city we have the chennai mathematical institute and when you say mathematical institute people doing phd we say very smart people but no very stupid people they built on water and then they did something even more stupid they said that their building is rainwater harvesting compliant you have built on top of the rainwater harvesting structure of the city how does it matter if your roof is collecting the water or not the main thing is that now we are breeding idiots in our premier institutes this is my favorite picture this is a very happy picture because the chennai airport was like this in 2015 the chennai airport's runway was built into the adiyar river they lied to the ministry of environment the ministry of environment was happily lied to they knew that they were lying but they said okay you know the project proponent airports authority of india has said the runway will not affect us and then adiyar river said you are lying and this is how it looks when adiyar river tells you the truth so this brings me to the north of chennai i told you about the kosasthalayar the kosasthalayar is a working class river that river is still got fisher folk in it there are still people dependent on it it's also a river that is not in the imagination of the city so when we talk about river beautification from the time of chief minister anna people have been promising to make the kuom beautiful there will be boating in kuom there will be boating in adiyar the sites of adiyar will become beautiful we will plant nochi trees over there all these kinds of things and lots of money has 
been sunk into beautifying these rivers or trying to beautify these rivers. Nobody talks about the Adyar River and uh, about the Kosas Palayar. The other thing is in the name of beautification, what has happened with uh, Kuam and Adyar is all the quote unquote encroachments. And when I say quote unquote encroachments, it means the structures or dwelling units of the poor and the marginalized in the city have all been removed. This is like a modern form of caste discrimination because in the city there's a very close match, a very high correlation between uh, caste and economic poverty. And so when you're moving these people out, in, out of the city into another water body in a very vulnerable place, you're actually engaging in discrimination in the name of beautification or environmentalism. Such an environmentalism will be a green environmentalism. It does not have the other shades of social justice to it. Um, so there we have the elite rivers of Kuam and Adyar, which are cleared of encroachments of the poor and the working class. And then on the northern side, we have the Kosas Palayar, which is a working class river encroached by elite encroachers and no government will do anything about it. So this is the river. Um, on your bottom right, you see a small finger sticking out towards the Bay of Bengal. That is the mouth of the river. And everything that you see within the magenta line <clears throat> is the creek or the Enur Creek or the backwaters. So where the waters come rushing from the Kosasthalayar during rainy season, it's a lot of water because the Kosasthalayar brings in two times the flood capacity of Adyar and Kuwam combined in just this one river. And when the, all that water comes, that water will have to escape into the sea through a very small opening called the Ennur Estuary. And so for so if you have such a large amount of water coming and a very small opening, it's like a very large road with a very leading to a very small road with one traffic light. The traffic builds up and will have to wait its turn to go. And it needs a waiting area. And so the river has created a backwater that runs from the south to the north, close to 25 kilometers of backwaters where the water backs. It stays there for four to five months and slowly drains out. And the water staying over there is a great thing because it recharges groundwater. It brings in nutrients. There is farming possible. There will be uh, salt harvesting possible. The fisher folk are happy. The uh, villages on the other side are happy because their homes are not flooded. All the water from their homes has gone to the place where it should go, which is to the Kadiveli Porambok, the Upangari Porambok, and the <clears throat> um, Karakari Porambok. So um, this area, if you leave it as it is, then North Chennai will not flood, Thiruvattur will not flood, Manali will not flood, Madhavaram will not flood, and Ponneri will not flood. Then we had the wonderful engineers in the Chennai Metropolitan Development Authority. These are very bright people with no brains because they studied engineering colleges and there we spent an extra year in college, the fourth year. I went to an engineering college and that fourth year is dedicated to removing any element of common sense that's left in you. So here we have the CMDA preparing a master plan for a city where they have carved out 2,000 acres of the Endur wetlands and earmarked it for the development of chemical industries. Okay. And it, it can't get more problematic than that. And even before that, we had what you see in black color is a coal stacking yard built inside the river. You have the HPCL's oil terminal, BPCL's oil terminal, the Vallur thermal power plant inside the river, parts of the um, ash pond or the coal ash pond also inside the river. Then north of it, we have the Katapalli Enur wetlands where we have landscapes like this, mangroves, mud flats where flamingos come, sand dunes like this, which are very important infrastructures of water. And all of this is sought to be converted by this happy man, uh, Gautam Adani into a big mega port. And if that port comes, you will have even more problems. So here we have a collision between two ways of imagining the world. So when you see that, you know, uh, Mr. Rajnikanth, if there are any fans, please forgive me, had uh, made a comment after Tutukudi uh, firing incident that Chennai will become a graveyard because of, or Tamil Nadu will become a graveyard because of people's protests. People's protests are the only thing keeping the state alive or other states for that matter. Because 
what are the people protesting against? You take the eight lane expressway, what are the people protesting against? If you look at hydrocarbon, what are they protesting against? They're protesting against land use change. They're saying that this land is more valuable as a farm than a road. This land is more valuable as a water body than a road. This land is more valuable as a, as a cropland than a hydrocarbon well. So it is a battle of values. On the one hand, we have the powerful espousing values that have very limited um, you know, uh, life. So if I convert, if I leave the farmland as a farmland, it will continue to feed us into eternity, hundreds of thousands of years. However long we will be there, it will give you, if the river is there, there'll be fish in it forever, which means fisher folk can exist forever. If you build a coal yard over there, the coal yard has a life of about 80 years. A power plant, a thermal power plant has a life of about 30 years. The river is a Chiranjeevi. It is ever alive, if you let it alive. So you have a, um, a, a battle between paved and open earth. So in terms of restoration, we can't be looking at one water body. You need to look at landscapes in terms of restoration. I will leave that for now. So when you're talking about, you know, we need to build capacity, we need to build the city. Actually, buildings are the problem. If the city wants to have a future, then we have to figure out how we can unbuild, how we can open up more land to the sky, not cover it with paved with paved surfaces, dig up some pavings. That is a national, that is a nationalist patriotic act that we can do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now we move on to the question and answer section. If do anyone have any questions to ask? If you have any questions, please put it on the question and answer box. When will the feedback form be available? Sorry, I don't have an answer to that. So it will be put it at the end of the session. Okay. Any questions? So my question is that uh, in spite of all this that we are doing, and I know there are a lot of pressure groups, etc. Why is it we have not been able to, you know, uh, check certain things? Why is it still it still goes on? Is it that uh, you know the powerful are so powerful that nothing can be done, or do you have any success stories that you can share with us? There are plenty of success stories, and so, so you have the eight lane expressway has been stopped. Of course, a lot of the success stories also happen after a lot is lost. So if you look at uh, the Tutukudi protest, I think I don't know whether I can call it a success because we had to lose 14 lives. Uh, we don't know whether the factory will remain closed after all the pain that we have gone through because the matter is now in the Supreme Court and we have to see what the outcome is. Um, we've had instances where uh, the communities have been able to prevail, for instance, in Enur Pulikat over a six year period of struggle. The communities, the fishing communities over there have managed to protect uh, the eastern part of the river uh, from encroachments. Kamarajar Port wanted to construct over there and they've been prevented from doing so. They illegally dumped earth on that area to reclaim that. They've been forced to remove it, but they've taken that and dumped it on another part of the water body and the fight is on to stop that. So these kinds of things require eternal vigilance and it requires long concerted fights. So if you look at the Kodekanal issue that uh, Jamima uh, briefly mentioned, uh, the Kodekanal issue is where a very large multinational company that all of us buy their products. I mean, uh, if you look at modern bread, it is manufactured by Unilever. And this company, if you look at their um, you know, corporate profile, you will mistake them for being a, a, a kind of a social work organization they project themselves as a mother Teresa of corporations, but they're actually like any other corporation, very interested in the bottom line. And they operated a mercury thermometer factory. Uh, 18 years, they operated it, poisoned many workers. And after that, there was a fight for about 15 to 16 years for the people to get the compensation that was due to them. Uh, so do you want to call it a success? Maybe a success, but it's taken 33 years, people's lives have been lost. But what, what I'm trying to tell you is 
it doesn't come like that. You don't sign one change.org petition and expect change to happen. It requires concerted work. It requires collective work and it requires work by everybody. You cannot outsource activism. You have to, you can't call up somebody and say, uh, there's somebody who's doing something like this behind my house. Can you please help? You have to go out there. You can ask for help as to how to go about doing it. But the first thing you need to do is get a bunch of friends, get three more people, talk about it. That's how communities are formed. Is there any way the Chennai one can be removed? Uh, well, it mean, if it's physically possible. Breaking down a building is very uh, possible. It's just like building. You do the reverse of building and you unbuild it. But will it be removed? I don't think so. Why will it not be removed? Because Tata Consultancy has an office in there. It belongs to very rich and powerful people. They have a license. So as far as the court is concerned, license is all that matters. As far as water is concerned, your location is what it matters. Just because the court says yeah, anyone can be there, the water is not going to do a pradarshanam and go around. It will come inside if you're in the wrong place. Uh, in our own way, how can we protect our ecosystem? So e protecting the ecosystem is not an individual work. As I said, you have to work as a collective. So you can you can avoid your, uh, uh, what do you call, plastic bags. You can cycle around. You can wear a cloth bag and go do all that thing. That is okay. It is good. But that is not going to save the world. You can, you can use that to, con if Mahatma Gandhi does it, then it of course inspires a lot of other people. It is possible to save the world. But you and I, if we do it, we can probably inspire three or four other people. It is very important, but you need to do more than that. So if you're looking to plant trees, also add to it, taking care of the trees, but plant grasses, plant shrubs, but also try and protect trees from being felled. Then practice politics, which means you need to be entering. Not, I'm not, when I say practice politics, I'm not saying you have to be a politician. But you have to look at collectivization. You have to look at mind changes in the government. Um, and, and, and you need to be doing this together, not alone. How can we stop these land grabbing maf mafia and politicians? Uh, it is very difficult to fight them. Um, I don't know if you have already tried to fight them and you find it difficult or you just think it will be difficult. Um, yes, it is difficult, but a lot of good things will require some amount of difficulty. And that's why I'm saying if you have more people, then you can share that burden the second thing is uh, you there are there are different levels of work you might be working as a small collective in your area and looking to ensure that in your ward or your panchayat or your uh, municipality you're trying to ensure that water bodies open lands park spaces any of the forum books are remain forum book and are made healthy so take a case work with your friends and then you'll also know that it is not as if all politicians are villains. You will find there are some good people who are doing it for some reason or the other. You will find um, bureaucrats who are uh, reasonably receptive to you. And when you do all these things and also within your community, you increase their awareness. You work towards asking the right questions and changing the way people think, then you'd be able to uh, uh, bring some change to the other. The most important thing is that if you fail, you cannot be dejected. There is no room for cynicism. There's no room for cynicism, cynicism for a person my age. There is absolutely no room for cynicism for people your age. The reason why there's no cynicism, it should not be cynicism. You are not an astrologer. You don't know what the future holds. So you need to fight for social change. It is not an option. I'm not asking you. I'm not requesting you. You have to. If you value yourself, if you value your family and your next generation, you have to be an activist. You can be a mother, you can be a father, but you also have to be an activist. All of us are activists in some way or the other. We have our opinions. We fight for change or we fight for some good things to remain they are, the way they are. But do this as a collective activism as well. Can we file cases on landlords? Yes, you can. And there is again, there is another way of activism. That is, you know, you use legal, you can use the laws, which means you can strengthen the laws. You can get the laws implemented. Again, you need to have a good understanding of the law. You need to have a good understanding of the land. You need to choose your moment right because the courts, it's not as if everybody in the court or all the judges rule only on law. There are other considerations as well. And so you need to be wait for the right person to come, take it in and get what you want to get. What measures can we take to protect these marshmallows? Sir, yeah. Sorry, sir. There's some questions from YouTube also, sir. So mm. 
one of the question is are these technologies that can work on a large scale to protect the environment are the technology technologies will not protect the environment people will technologies sometimes protect the people who are selling the technology so uh, you need to be very wary about technology because as i said what we are facing with environment is not necessarily a technological problem it's a problem of values as social workers you will understand that better that if you don't value a water body enough then you will build on it and then if you ask the technology people to come in engineers are extremely dangerous people they will never question whether the question is right or wrong you give them a wrong question they'll give you a right answer for the wrong question which will be a wrong answer so then they will tell you that on top of pallikarne marshland if we don't want it to flood then raise chennai one on pillars so that water can flow below now a marshland is not just water flowing a marshland is an ecosystem that requires sunlight to hit the water and penetrate through it so that you know um, the the plants can grow the underwater plants can grow it's an ecosystem but it is difficult for engineers to appreciate that so be extremely wary of building technologies to address social problems uh so there's an another question by dr s lalita the tamil nadu state has environment policy 2017 but is it is not reflected in action the activities of the government in the name of urban development or contracting and the environmental policy what is your comment on sir no no that is true but then i the think that it is not just a matter of policy as i said you know there are laws that right? just right now we have filed a case in court there is something called the interstate migrant workers act and this act is not known to people inside the labor department so it's a 1979 act and if this act had been followed when the corona crisis struck we would have known the exact or roughly the exact probably to about a lakh uh, plus or minus the number of migrant workers in the state this requires employers to register themselves with the labor department it requires contractors who hire anything more than five people five migrant workers to register themselves and get a license in that license you have to tell how many workers are there with you where they are all the workers are supposed to get one visit back home paid for by the employer so if you had this act this act actually in, in enforced then we would have not had a problem we would have been able to send the migrant workers home back with dignity why was this act not implemented we did we filed an rti it says that none of the districts in the in the in the state of tamil nadu have actually implemented this act nobody has registers of how many employers are there we have some ridiculously low figure like 800 employers in all of tamil nadu one of the most industrialized and urbanized states so why is this lack this act not being implemented it is again boils down to an issue of value if this act were protecting those living in greenways road or poise garden or raja navalayapuram the act will be implemented this act is meant to protect the migrant workers who are at the bottom of the working class these are unorganized nameless people who come from a different state and mostly young men so it doesn't matter if the act is not implemented so okay. why is the environment policy not implemented because we don't see the environment is important enough to deserve that kind of implementation so the next question why not we insist for leakage of at least district level rivers and streams with all the tanks and ponds why not insist to plant palm tree on the beds of tanks and rivers i don't understand what linking rivers will do is it an act of environmentalism or is it an act anti environmentalism because a river already knows how to flow we have just come in over here how do we know which side the river should flow whether it should flow and why should it be that way because we don't have any rivers there there's no those no such thing as surplus rivers and uh, you know deficit rivers all rivers have periods of periods of sur surplus if you look at the gundar or the vaigai in ramnadapuram district most of the year it is deficit two months of the river or 15 days of the river of the year it will run in tremendous surplus how are you going to be able to move that water from one place to another you won't be able to do that the other thing is that we are thinking the solution will come from elsewhere if you can't handle the water inside chennai what are you going to do with water from kaveri you'll do the same thing you'll put it inside those leaky metro water tankers that will spill the water everywhere and half of it is gone by the time it comes to your house do you see 
your pal vandi or milk vandi or your uh, uh, petrol tankers spilling petrol and milk no because in our minds petrol and milk is more valuable where when, when we when we had the water crisis our chief minister brought uh, water in 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 trains from jolarpete where the people in jolarpete don't want water the people who long who live along the kaveri don't need the water why should the city get it why are we stealing water Uh, sir, the next question: What is your view on Chennai River Restoration uh, Re, uh, Restoration Trust, which is working on Chennai Chennai's water bodies? There is no visual results even after ten to fifteen years of the trust. So the trust again uh, takes over uh, an activity that ought to be done that ought to have citizens engagement, eliminates the citizens engagement, and hands it over to engineers and consultants. so this trust after much pressuring from the fisher folk and us in, in the part of the save enur creek campaign decided to do a enur restoration project and they hired a consultant that consultant came and did a consultancy report the first thing that is required for good science is honesty and in our scientific community honesty integrity and courage are lacking there is a deficit of that maybe we can do interlinking of scientific community so we can borrow some integrity from surplus countries and put it in in india so here we have this consultancy that's supposed to do a scientific report on enur creek they came out with a report that found that said that blue whales brides whales uh, the the uh, gangetic dolphin the alligator from sundarbans all these things are present inside Enur Creek. The Enur Creek has barely enough water for a a a, a coke a crane to stand. How can it have a blue whale, the largest mammal in the world? So you have ridiculous. So so I hope you answer your question that the Chennai Rivers Restoration Trust is only as good as the amount of public pressure we can put on it, and as good as the integrity of the people who are running it. These are people who are who are inside it are there for a job. and they will do that the, they will do the job that the government tells them to so that is the problem so uh, one last question so how can environmental education for students be more be made more effective uh, <clears throat> well two things one i think to not restrict environmental education to the issue of plants and trees and and uh, and uh, uh, birds and animals but look at the human linkages and the fact that environment is an extremely political issue it affects different people differently in defining what an environmental problem is the definition is made by elite people it is made by institutional scientists rather than people with common normal you know i mean experiential wisdom uh the solutions that come out of such environmental defining environmental problems in this way those solutions are also crafted by people with their head in the clouds so for environmental education i think the most important thing is to try and ensure that we can reinstate common sense the second is i think that in environmental education a lot of field level understanding is required field level understanding means the first thing that we do when we go to college or something is we go and do awareness camps in a fishing village or in a farming village you don't do awareness camp you do if you do an awareness camp over there then make sure that the awareness camp is for yourself you are not the one who is giving awareness we don't know jack in fact people who have gone through about 15 years of education through our formal school system end up coming out as idiots we have to i had to reeducate myself after finishing my post graduate and that reeducation happened at the hands of ordinary people and their common sense experience of the environment so environmental education will be found outside your classroom it will be it will be found from ordinary people and as people who are interested in educating themselves and as <clears throat> people like myself as uh, teachers i think we can best be facilitators to ensure that you are able to access uh, knowledge from ordinary people that knowledge would need to be understood by you would need to be analyzed and synthesized it doesn't mean that everything that the people a fisherman says is absolutely a fact but then there's a lot of 
important information, you need to be able to figure out a way to sift through the good stuff and leave out the unimportant stuff. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions so patiently and also for your valuable time. Now I request Dr. Lalita, ma'am, for the closing remark. Ma'am, over to you. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the enlightening session. Indeed, uh, it's really interesting to listen to you. And uh, you, you made us to realize and reflect upon uh, the importance of water resources and its conservation. And as you rightly said, the civic uh, engagement and collective action by the citizens and the government are very important. And I hope that uh, like the sensitization and awareness on conservation of water bodies and water resources uh, among the citizens will definitely uh, you know, encourage them to participate actively in the conservation process. Because I, I myself uh, experienced that when I was doing my research work uh, for my postdoctoral research studies. I found that resources are plenty, but the resources are not well taken care of by the community because the negligence among the community, the uh, lack of uh, no willingness to participate, uh, lack of ownership, and similarly from the government end also, uh, not all the time the resources are not you know uh, well uh, given importance, uh, like uh, the, the importance are given uh, to the various other activities than the you know protection of water resources that I really witnessed when I was doing my research. But finally, what I found is. Uh, it is only the ultimate responsibility is lies in the hands of uh, the citizens first and also the government authorities. So, uh, really, sir, it, it really made us you know, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to understand, to reflect upon every one of us, the individual's responsibility and collective responsibility in protection of water resources. Uh, and thank you very much, sir, again. And I also thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on, uh, give my uh, you know, opinion and views on this. And uh, I also thank the participants for their valuable you know, participation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And I thank each and everyone, and I thank each and everyone present here. And uh, right now, I would also like to thank our department for giving us this opportunity to conduct this webinar. And I also thank uh, our speaker for taking time for us and giving us his valuable thoughts on the encroachment and i would like to take a statement from this ppt that not all encroachments are equal that the statement made a huge impact today on uh, this webinar and i also thank dr lalita and mr jayan for attending this webinar thank you very much uh, at the end, uh, the feedback link will be put on the chat uh, chat box uh, in the Zoom platform, and for YouTube, the your link will be found in the comment box. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much, Inga, for spending your time with us. It was really nice. Thank you, Lalita, for being here. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Nice, nice. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, students, for organizing this session. Thank you all very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you, Lalita. Thank you, ma'am. Ma